right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Alberto Espe from the University of Cincinnati. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Alidresa Atri. He is the Ray Dolby Endowed Chair in Brain Health Research at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. He's also visiting faculty at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Atri presented the clinical trials plenary session titled 5-HT6 antagonist as adjunctive therapy to cholinesterase inhibitors in patients with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Idaloperdine in phase three. Idaloperdine, I hope I've uh, pronounced that well. Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, Ali, you've done a terrific job with the session this morning. The plenary session was incredibly well attended and uh, your results on idaloperdine were fantastic. And we have to uh, start by admitting that there has been uh, too long a time uh, between the last drug ever approved uh, by the FDA for Alzheimer's. So this particular drug looks uh, incredibly promising. But let's start from just the big perspective. Why a serotonin uh, receptor as a target for cognitive impairment and dementia? Um, so first of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Espe, and the ANN AN and uh, colleagues uh, uh, for this opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm really privileged to be here and talk to you about this. Um, so <laughs> the, the, the first answer is why not, but, uh, yeah. but generally there's actually um, uh, the, the serotonin receptors, um, there's a, there are G-couple proteins, seven of them, and it turns out that 5-HT6 is exclusively expressed in mostly in the CNS and particularly in, in frontal lobes and hippocampus and some in the striatum also. And there's been a, a long history of, of um, uh, you know, these receptors modulating other neurochemicals and systems that seem to be important for um, cognitive processing. So uh, like everything else, you know, uh, in, our, in our field, uh, we've really, um, based on uh, biological effect and studies in mouse, we've actually cured Mousheimer's, um, but we haven't been able to make that leap into people. And so I can go up there like I did today and propose a mechanism and show you all the data, um, but ultimately we have to test these in people. And so I don't wanna thank you for saying the fantastic results. I'm, I'm, I think that the, uh, the phase two results are really, really strong, um, but we have to do the studies to make sure that they follow because I've just had our, my heart broken so much in the last you know, 15 years on this stuff. Well, uh, we have all had our heartbrokens with the therapies that look very promising in phase two studies and perhaps fail to materialize in phase three. I, I would say though that uh, based on what you've shown in terms of the effect size, yep. which was greater than what you initially had anticipated, uh, an ADASCOG of uh, yep. over two points, uh, should uh, be uh, projectable, I would think, into phase three studies, don't you think? Hope so. Let's uh, hope, hope so. so. And and you know, um, so that was really a nice result. So the phase two made its uh, primary endpoint quite nicely, and the ADAS cog, you know, is a cognitive measure, and uh, so it was powered for a two point difference, and you know there was a uh, two point two, two point four difference that was achieved. Um, and the other nice thing was that you saw congruent um, uh, sig a signal in the other domains. So you saw you know this effect on cognition, but also you saw, um, you know, a really nice trend depending on even significance, depending on what kind of analysis you did um, on activity daily living, um, on global status change. And what I didn't present actually was um, looking at the domains of the neuropsychiatric inventory um, and um, looking at those different domains, there seems to be a signal actually for reducing anxiety and hallucinations potentially. So all those went in the right direction, which is what you want. Yeah. And then the easiest way to, to kill off a drug that's very promising is to have um, bad, bad, bad effects, you know, yeah. adverse events. And luckily there weren't any. So um, you know, there was this transient bump in LFTs that wouldn't have been noticeable other, other than from blood draws, right. which was asymptomatic and you know, it went away whether people continued or didn't continue. So, so you're right, uh, you know, we're very promising phase two results. But what happens is phase two is done on in, in smaller sites, and yeah. then you end up going to a global program in 30 countries, right. and you go into 400 and something sites, and so you know you have that signal, but then you could have this variability from our, from our measures, and that's what you always worry 
that, yeah. that could get that could hurt your study because the effect sizes in, in six month studies tend to be 0 0.2, 0 0.3 on that on that level, right? right. Um, clinically significant, um, but can potentially be drowned out if you have a lot of variance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Let's talk about the variants because you're actually suggesting uh, that uh, uh, this will not be a cure and we understand that we've made incremental improvements in the treatment of Alzheimer's and other conditions, but really not substantial ones. And perhaps it is all about the variants and we assume the variance is applicable to all diseases when we treat them as single entities and one topic that we've uh, really sort of nailed substantially at these sessions is that uh, perhaps we need to be thinking about this as separate entities and the uh, incoming era of precision medicine would suggest that uh, what we're calling the variability of a single disease might in fact represent uh, different uh, subtypes if not uh, different diseases that uh, perhaps when you look at therapies that have failed already they may have been really good for a subtype of individuals we never recognize. Right. You're, you're absolutely correct. And we have to get a lot smarter about our data and how we analyze the data, how we design it. Um, and so, you know, Alzheimer's disease is this sort of, I call it the organ, um, you know, brain organ failure syndrome of the Alzheimer's spectrum. You know, you have this, these clinical phenotypes that look very similar. But really what's driving it, you could actually have multiple different mechanisms. You could have typical Alzheimer's pathology, amyloids, you know, uh, you know and, and tau. Sometimes you could have tau only. You could have a lot of vascular changes, inflammation. And it, as I mentioned sort of in the plenary, the, 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 what we've really been able to do well in the last um, 10, 15 years is to start having some biomarkers and understanding where things are starting to change. And um, now we have a w you know, some ways of looking at um, amyloids uh, in the brain um, early on, which we understand you know, 10, 15, 20 years before people show their you know, memory failure. Um, people are accumulating amyloid and it's kind of saturating, right? And after that, something else in some people happens that uh, induces um, you know, synaptotoxicity and you have tangles forming and you can measure those. Um, and you can see synaptic failure. And you can see that, for example, potentially through uh, fMRI, which is research, you know, something that we do in research, but also PET scans, for example. So we're getting a better understanding of this stuff. So, and, and getting smarter about clinical trials, looking at quote unquote the disease modifying drugs, for example, amyloid, that were first tested later on in the disease, in the moderate stages understanding, you know what, by that time, it may be too late, so you have to go earlier and earlier. So there are companies and colleagues that are really tr testing this earlier, even now in people who are not symptomatic yet. So the idea is, if you can figure out early on what type you have, you may go on the right type of disease-modifying drug, and ultimately, as you accumulate symptoms, you can get you know, a, a cocktail, for, for lack of a better word, of things added. And look what happened, for example, with HIV. We've taken something that was uniformly devastating. I, I was a medical student at UCSF, and all my patients died in the 90s. And we've made that disease into something that's more chronic and manageable, and um, hopefully we'll be able to do that for Alzheimer's disease. I do hope so. Uh, just uh, to then uh, go from the little picture to the big picture, uh, the little picture here, we're, we're having uh, serotonin uh, as a mechanism, serotonin antagonism mm -hmm. as a mechanism to uh, raise uh, a variety of neurotransmitters, acetylcholine among them. I presume that that's a major difference between this drug, idaloperdine, which of course I'll pronounce much better if successful because we'll all be talking about it, <laughs> and uh, donepecil or rivastigmine, for instance. I presume that's a major uh, yeah, mechanism. Yeah, it's, it's a different difference. mechanism, correct, because they're, you know, the cholinesterase inhibitors, whether they're working on acetylcholine and butyl, butyl, butyl cholinesterase, et cetera, they're working in the, you know, up in the synapse to s stop the degradation or decrease the degradation of, of, of acetylcholine, whereas this is probably working in these, um, you know, uh, glutamergic uh, neurons or GABAergic neurons or interneurons, um, which have, can project all the different things, including um, glutamate, GABA, and affect multiple neurotransmitters emissions down the line. And, you know, the, the mechanism of this stuff in, in humans is so complex. You have these multiple systems of neurotransmitters interacting dynamically. So you tweak one part and you, know what's, you don't know what's gonna happen to the other part. Right. So, you know, given the, the nice effect of uh, preclinical studies, that's great, but the beauty was that phase two data, like yeah. you mentioned, so. Yeah. 
And, and I, I presume also that because these uh, receptors, uh, these five HD6 uh, receptors are everywhere, there isn't a need here for a biomarker, particularly an imaging biomarker of receptors because presumably they are everywhere. Most people would have them. As opposed to the therapies you were talking about, amyloid therapies, you would want to make sure that you're actually applying it to people with uh, quite a bit of amyloid in their brains. Correct, yeah. So it's, it's, it's different in the sense that, um, uh, you know, for this trial, uh, entrance criteria did not require um, an amyloid PET image to come in. So we were taking people based on clinical criteria coming in. Now, so they've had the syndrome, the phenotype. Um, do they all have amyloid in their brain? Well, data suggests, you know, from other studies that um, people like myself um, can look at somebody at the end and say, well, you look like you have Alzheimer's disease, but guess what? In their brain, they may not have amyloid. Yeah. So this is, and, and if you don't, what do you do for those people, which tend to be, tend to be sometimes 20 or 30% of folks? Um, so that's why it's nice to have these um, neurotransmitter approaches. Absolutely. And the other thing I wanted to actually add was I showed some data um, from phase two that looked at um, cholinergic side effects. And if this was only affecting uh, acetylcholine, just increasing that, uh, you may um, find some peripheral side effects like diarrhea or falls, or and it didn't. And you know there definitely actually was a signal, maybe potentially even the other way, that it actually um, um, you know uh, maybe even ameliorated it. We don't know, but right. so it's probably affecting multiple systems. Yeah. And then again, the question is, what happens long term? That so there's biological effect, efficacy, and then there's effectiveness, which is what we do in clinical practice, right? Long term, we give it to people. We don't say, I'm sorry, you missed your dose yesterday, I'm gonna kick you out of my clinic. We don't do that. So, uh, you know, we have to see long term what, uh, how people do with these drugs. Absolutely. Just to, just to end now, this is the last uh, item. Uh, you mentioned that in the 90s, you had your patients dying of HIV. And of course, uh, now you're seeing your patients dying of AD. Yeah. Uh, and other neurodegenerative conditions. Yeah. What's going to happen 10 years from now? What would you be looking back to in the 2010s, 2010s to uh, get a sense of uh, what we had it wrong and what we might be heading uh, right here? Yeah, I don't think we got it wrong per se. We honestly, we have incredible dedicated people in the field um, and it is a priority, to the recognition that because of this, you know, silver tsunami, this aging, uh, you know, the people are aging, um, we're going to double and triple the numbers over the next few decades. And unless we can retard the end stages, which is, which are really, really devastating, uh, require 24-7 care, um, we know what's going to happen actually to, to the Medicare budget. We know that we're going to pay a huge uh, economic cost. Our healthcare system is going to be really strained. And of course, morally and ethically, we have, we have, we have an imperative to do something. So the biggest impediment, I think, really has been funding for us, which is finally maybe starting to go in the right direction. Um, but every study shows that um, compared to, for example, cardiovascular disease or, um, or, or cancer, which again is not one disease, um, they're funded at the levels of four, five, six billion dollars, and they've been funded at those levels for 30, 40 years. HIV AIDS, three and a half billion, four billion dollars or so for 30 years. And until two years ago, you know, all of the dementia was funded at about $460 million. And now it's creeping up to 600, 700, 800. So um, probably funding. Yeah. yeah, very good. Well, Ali, you've been terrific. I, again, commend you for your presentation this Thank morning you, at the plenary session. Uh, I think that the effort you're presenting and leading uh, moving forward is a gigantic one. And I think that this will be an important leap uh, in our understanding of uh, Alzheimer's and, and new potential therapeutics for it. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Be well. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, the audience. And, and, and